Today we are going to discuss about the microscopic structural analysis of nanomaterials part 1. Basically we have divided all the microscopic structural analysis of different types of nanomaterials. There are several types of experiments. So, we have divided into different parts. So, first let us know that what is nanomaterials. So, nanomaterials are materials with an average grain size is less than 100 nanometers. Nanometer is the unit of length in metric equal to 1 billionth of a meter that is 10 to the power minus 9 as we all know that one. So, what is nanoparticles? So, 1 nanometer whatever I have told already that is, is equal to 10 to the power minus 9 meter is equal to 10 angstrom. It is extremely small because uh, 10 to the power uh, minus 9 meter that means we cannot see it by our naked eyes. Particle small piece of the matter. Nanoparticles are objects with all three external dimensions at the nano scale. So, we are having different deviations in the nanoparticles like 0 d, 1 d, 2 d, 3 d like that. So, I will tell you everything in brief in the next slides. Shape structure and aggregations of particles at nano scale influence the properties of materials at the macro level itself. So, if you see this image, in this particular image you can see that this is the nanometers 10 to the power minus 9, 1 to 100 nanometers, then 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 5, 10 to the power 6 like that. So, when you are talking about the nanomaterials that is 1 to 10 to the power 2 that means 100 nanometers. So, generally the micellar, liposome, dendrimer, gold nanoshells, quantum dot, polymers, chains these all are the Cummings. So, this is the generally is the nanomaterial scale, but when you are talking about the 10 to the power 8 nanometers generally it is the size of the tennis ball. So, within this range our whole materials more or less 1 to 100 nanometers within this range our whole nanomaterials lies. So, why nanomaterials? Because nowadays every researcher, every scientist, everybody are talking about the nanomaterials. So, the first questions come to our mind is that why you are using the nanomaterials, what is the beauty behind it. So, nanotechnology exploits benefits of ultra small size enabling the use of particles to deliver a range of important benefits. What are those? First is that small particles are invisible as I told already we cannot see it by our naked eyes. Transparent coatings or films are attainable. Then small particles are very wet efficient. Surface can be modified with minimal material. Behavior of nanomaterials may depend more on surface area than the particle compositions itself. Yes, of course, we have prepared some materials. So, just changing the outer surface or maybe by uh, coating or maybe by dipping or maybe any kind of surface treatment, we can change the whole properties of that particular material. Say initially it was in hydrophobic in nature. So, just give a coating of hydrophilic materials, we can make it hydrophilic or maybe our strength was less. So, after doing some high strength material coating, we can make it the harder materials. So, like this way we can change the surface properties of that particular material, not the chemical properties we are going to be changed. So, relative surface area, one of the principal factor that enhance its already I told reactivity, strength and the electrical properties. Previously it was the conducting materials, now we are making it totally the insulating materials. So, what are the properties of nanomaterials? Increased surface area to volume ratio due to the small particle size, high strength, hardness, formability and the toughness, exhibit super plasticity even at lower temperature. Size of grain controls the mechanical, electrical, optical, chemical and magnetic properties. Melting point of nanomaterials get reduced on reducing the grain size. Magnetizations and coercivity are higher in this particular case. Right hand side you can see that there are we have jotted down the applications of the nanomaterials. So, there are huge, huge number of applications generally um, where we are using these kind of nano particles. So, suppose in the broad way if we divided it, we, can, we are using it in the textile applications, biomedical, healthcare, food agriculture, industrial, electronics, environment, renewable energy and then even after that if we divided 
or maybe subdivide this broad. So, we are using it for the drug delivery, cancer therapy, drug control release, EV protections, food packaging, then high density data storage, environmental catalysis, fuel cell catalysis, so many. Then after that also again we became it more broader. So, we can make it for the sensor applications, we are using it for the EV blocking coatings, we are using it for the bone growth, molecular tagging, dental ceramics. So, there are n number of applications where we are using nanoparticles today. So, first we have to classify the nanomaterials. So, based on dimensions, it is divided into four parts, one is called the 0 dimensional or maybe the 0 d, 1 dimensional that is 1 d, 2 dimensional that is 2 d and the 3 dimensional that is called the 3 d. So, what is 0 dimensional? All dimensions at the nano scale itself. So, that means x, y, z all directions. So, 0 d. So, this small confinement all the dimensions are into the nano scale. So, x, y, z value are into the nano scale examples like nanoparticles or maybe the quantum dots. When you are talking about the one dimensional 1 d that means, we are talking about the 1 d. In this case two dimensions at the nano scale either may be x or y or maybe y or z or maybe x or z. So, in this case x and y are into the nano scales and z dimensions is into the macro scale. So, nano rods, nano wires and the nano tubes. Then two dimensionals one dimension at the nano scale when we are talking about the two dimensionals. So, one dimension only the z dimensions over here into the nano scale x and y are into the macro scale. So, like nano films, nano layers and the nano coatings. When we are talking about the three dimensional, so no dimensions at the nano scales all dimensions at the macro scale itself. So, it is the whole one. So, examples like nano crystalline structure or maybe the bulk structure or maybe the bulk nanomaterials generally we are telling it. Now, we are going into the more wider into this particular topic. So, how to characterize this kind of nanomaterials? So, characterization refers to the study of materials features such as its composition and the structure. Characterization of nanomaterials involved determining the structural optical, electrical, magnetic and the mechanical properties depending on their applications. Structural characterization involves determining the morphology that means shape and size of nanomaterials, arrangement of the atoms that means crystal structure, material composition of the nanomaterials. And when you are talking about the optical characterization that involves determining the light emissions and the light absorption characteristics of the structures itself. Now, general characterization techniques. So, if we divided into by types, so there are total 6 techniques. One is called the electron probe characterization techniques, next optical imaging probe characterization techniques which we are going to discuss in this particular lecture. Then we are having scanning probe characterization techniques, ion particle probe characterization techniques which we are going to discuss into our next lecture and photon spectroscopic probe characterization techniques, thermodynamic characterization techniques which we are going to discuss in our last lectures. Now, first electron probe characterization techniques that is also divided into several parts. First is called the SEM, SEM means scanning electron microscopy. What is the utility? Raster imaging, topology and morphology of that particular materials that kind of information generally we are getting. Next is called the TEM transmission electron microscopy, imaging or maybe the particle size or shape generally we are getting. HRTEM high resolution transmission electron microscopy, imaging structure chemical analysis. STEM scanning transmission electron microscopy, generally for the biological samples we are doing. EPMA electron probe micro analysis, particle size or maybe the local chemical analysis we are doing lead that is low energy electron diffractions generally for the surface and the adsorbate bonding of that particular nanomaterials. So, by doing this kind of characterizations we are getting this kind of informations about that materials. So, first we are going to discuss about the scanning electron microscopy in small we are generally calling it as a same. 
SIM is a type of electron microscope that images a sample by scanning it with a high energy beam of electrons in a raster scan pattern. What is the basic principles? When a beam of electrons, generally that we are having that electron gun. So, through that we are generating the electron and then that electron through some detectors and some lenses and some magnetic lenses, it is falling onto our substrate or maybe our materials. Strikes the surface of specimen and interacts with the atoms of sample signals in the form of secondary electrons backscattered electrons and characteristic X rays are generated that contain information about the samples, surface topography or maybe the compositions etcetera. So, what we can see with SEM? So, generally topography, texture and surface of the samples, we can see the surface how it is looks like. Morphology, size, shape and order of the particles, say suppose I have used some kind of nanoparticles inside the matrix that I can see. Compositions, elemental compositions of samples. So, I am having a composites. So, what are the element I have used and more or less it can give you the percentage also. also. Then the crystalline structure arrangement present within samples. So, this is the same instrument generally we are using for uh, uh, taking the picture of any kind of nanomaterials. So, generally there are three modes of operations. First one is called the primary which is the high resolutions generally 1 to 5 nanometer secondary electron imaging. Then second one is called the secondary generates characteristics x-rays identification of elemental composition of sample by EDAX techniques and last one is called the tertiary that is generates the backscattered electronic images clues to the elemental composition of sample. So, here you can see that is the general picture we have given that of the pollen grains. So, in this particular case you can see that we are having that electron gun, then electron beam through condenser lens it is coming, then it is falling onto the sample itself. So, we are having three detectors over there, the detectors BSE, then secondary and another one is the magnification through magnification control that scan generator and we are getting the display over there. So, electronic devices are used to detect and amplify the signals and display them as an image on a cathode ray tube in which the raster scanning is synchronized with that of microscope. In same beam passes through pairs of scanning coils or pairs of deflector plates in the electron column to the final lens which deflect the beam horizontally and vertically. The image displayed is therefore a distribution map of the intensity of the signal being emitted from the scanned area of the specimen itself. So, what is the advantages? So, bulk samples can be observed and larger sample area can be viewed, generates photo like images, very high resolution images are possible, same can yield valuable information regarding the purity as well as the degree of aggregations. Then what are the disadvantages? Samples must have surface electrical conductivity, non-conductive samples need to be coated with a conductive layer, time consuming and expensive, sometimes it is not possible to clearly differentiate nanoparticles from the substrate itself, same cannot resolve the internal structure of these domains. Now next one is called the transmission electron microscopy, in short generally we are calling it as a TIM. So what is the principle? Crystalline sample interacts with electron beam mostly by diffraction rather than the absorption. Intensity of diffraction depends on the orientation of planes of atoms in a crystal relative to electron beam. High contrast image can be formed by blocking deflected electrons which produces a variation in electron intensity that reveals informations on the crystal structure. This generate both bright or light field and dark field images. So, like this way we are having that electron source, then we are having that condenser lens, then condenser aperture, then sample we are keeping, through that we are having that objective lens, then objective aperture, then we are having the projector lens and then we are having the screen on which we are getting the image. So, what can be seen with TIM? On the basis of morphology, generally shape, size, order of particles in sample. 
If we are going to see the crystalline structure, we can see arrangement of atoms in sample and defects in crystalline structure. And if we are going to see about the or maybe go, we are going to know about the composition, so elemental compositions of the sample. So, this is the standard TAME instruments generally what we are using. What are the advantages? High magnifications, ability to enlarge an image and resolution, ability to distinguish two very close objects as separate images, provide informations about internal ultra structure of cells, images are high quality and detailed. So, here in this case you can see that we are getting the image into the 50 nanometer scale or maybe 200 nanometer scale like silver cubic nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles or maybe some kind of bacteria image. Of course, there is certain disadvantages also. So, what are those? Temps are large and very expensive, laborious sample preparation, operation and analysis requires special training. Sample are limited to those that are electron transparent. Temps require special housing and maintenance. Images are black and white. Now, we are going to do the comparison study of TEM versus SEM. So, if we talk about the TEM, so beam voltage is generally 100 to 400 kilo volt. In the case of SEM, it is 1 to 30 kilo volt. Focus of analysis, it is internal or maybe the beyond surface, for same it is surface of the sample. Modes, broad beams and scanning probes, in this case it is only the scanning probe. Smallest probe 0 0.5 nanometer that means 5 angstrom using stem, it is more or less 1 nanometer that means 10 angstrom. Best resolution 0 0.14 nanometer that means 1.4 angstrom lattice imaging. In this case, it is more or less 1 nanometer 10 angstrom. Contrast forward scattered electrons, same it is secondary emissions and the back scattered electrons. Insulators here no charging, here is the charging effects. Sample thickness it is 10 to 200 nanometer that means 100 to 2000 angstrom. Here in this case it is 1 to 10 millimeter. Sample diameter less than 3 millimeter across it is full wafers. So, that means you can cover the whole area, but of course it is within the limit. Minimum preparation time it is more or less 4 hours, it is less than 1 minute. Image presentations that is the vital one, it is giving you the 2D image, it is giving you the 3D image. Display of images on TV monitor, it is on fluorescent screen. Now, we are going to discuss about the high resolution transmission electron microscopy, which is known as the HR TIM. It is also known as phase contrast and imaging mode of TIM. It allows the imaging of crystallographic structure of a sample at an atomic scale. Independent interactions with sample results the electron wave to pass through the imaging system of microscope where it undergoes further phase change and interferes as image wave in the imaging plane. Recorded image is not a direct representation of the sample crystallographic structure. What is the uses? To study local microstructures like lattice fringe, glide plane or maybe the screw axis for surface atomic arrangement of the crystalline nanoparticles. So, when we are going to do the comparison of the TAME image, so you can see in the standard team, we are having two samples like Cu2O and silicon and in between that we are having one interlayer of course. But in this case, it is not clear, but when we are seeing the same sample under the high resolution team, so scale are same, but totally the resolution is different. So, in this case, we can see a clear layer that means the interlayer in between the two materials. Next, scanning transmission electron microscopy or maybe it is known as STEM. Basic principle of image formation is different from static beam TEM. Small spot size is formed on the sample surface with the condenser lenses. Probe is scanned on the sample surface. Signal is detected by an electron detector amplified and synchronously displayed. This is also two types or maybe by two types generally we do these detections. So, one is called the half angle annular dark field 
in short it is called the HADF, it is a good for Z contrast, another one is called the annular bright field or maybe the ABF which is good for low weight elements. So, generally the resolutions limited by the spot size because you can see that the on sample it is falling as a small spot, stem have poor resolution, but better contrast. Now, next one is that electron probe microanalysis. in short it is called the EPMA. An electron probe microanalyzer is a micro beam instrument used for in situ non destructive chemical analysis of minute solid samples. EPMA is also called as electron micro probe or maybe the probe. It is similar as same with added capability of chemical analysis. So, this is the overall uh, or maybe the normal picture of the EPMA machines. Principle how it is working? If a solid material is bombarded by an accelerated and focused electron beam, the incident electron beam has sufficient energy to liberate both matter and energy from the sample itself. These electron sample interactions mainly liberate heat, but they also yield both derivative electrons and x-rays. The quantized x-rays are characteristic of the element itself. EPMA analysis is considered to be a non-destructive testing because we are not going to harm the samples or maybe the hitting the samples or maybe the breaking the samples. So, it is possible to reanalyze the same materials more than one times. That means, several times we can do this testing onto the sample itself. Four components of EPMA from top to bottom. So, generally they are, there are four components. First one is called the electron source, a tungsten filament cathode referred to as a gun. So, this is the number one. Series of electromagnetic lenses located in the column of instrument used to condense and focus electron beam emanating from source. This comprises electron optics and operates in an analogous way to light optics. So, this zone is known as the number 2. Then sample chamber with movable sample stage x, y, z means any direction you can move your samples that is under a vacuum to prevent gas and vapor molecules from interfering with electron beam on its way to sample. A light microscope allows for direct optical observations of the sample itself. So, here this is known as the number 3 zone over there. Then variety of detectors arranged around the sample chamber that are used to collect x-rays and electrons emitted from the sample itself. So, we are having that secondary electron detector, we are having the backscattered electron detector and this is the, so this zone is number 3 and these all are the detectors are known as number 4. Applications? Quantitative EPMA analysis is the most commonly used method for chemical analysis of geological materials at small scale. Used for analysis of synthetic materials such as optical wafers, thin plumes, micro circuits, semiconductors and the superconducting ceramics. Strengths? Electron probe is primarily tool for chemical analysis of solid materials at small spatial scales. Spot chemical analysis can be obtained in situ which allows the user to detect even small compositional variations within textural context or within chemically zoned materials. What are the limitations? Electron probe unable to detect the lightest elements like hydrogen, helium or maybe the lithium. Probe analysis also cannot distinguish between the different valence states of iron. Next is called the low energy electron diffraction. In short, it is calling it as a lead. Lead is the principal technique for the determination of surface structures. It is generally electron diffraction, but sample is now the surface of a solid. Two ways of using the lead, first one is called the qualitatively, where diffraction pattern is recorded and analysis of spot positions yields information on size, symmetry and rotational alignment of adsorbate unit cell with respect to substrate unit cell. And then next one is called the quantitatively, where intensities of various diffracted beams are recorded as a function of incident electron beam energy to generate the IV curves, 
which by comparison with theoretical curves provide accurate information on atomic positions. How we are going to perform this lead experiment? Use a beam of electrons of low energy generally 20 to 200 electron volt incident normally on the sample itself. So, do we are having that electron gun over here. So, directly it is falling onto your materials or maybe the crystals. Sample itself must be a single crystal with a well ordered surface structure in order to generate a backscattered electron diffraction pattern. So, after falling it is backscattering only elastically scattered electrons contribute to diffraction pattern. Lower energy secondary electrons are removed by energy filtering grids placed in front of fluorescent skin that is employed to display the pattern itself. So, initially we are putting the grids and then after that we are putting the screen. Basic theory how it is working by the principle of wave particle duality the beam of electrons may be equally regarded as a succession of electron waves incident normally on the sample. These waves will be scattered by regions of high localized electron density that is the surface atoms which can therefore be considered to act as point scatters. Wavelength of electrons is given by Drebe Broglie equations that is lambda is equal to h by p. So, where p is equal to m b which is equal to 2 m e k root over is equal to root over 2 m e v. m is equal to mass of electron, v is equal to velocity, e is equal to electronic charge, e k is the kinetic energy, capital V is the acceleration voltage in electron volt. So, this is the generally the electron gun. So, this is the lead pattern obtained from silicon 1117 into 7 reconstructed surface itself. What are the advantages? relatively simple and cheap experimental setup that is less than 100 k euro. High surface sensitivity, easy information on symmetry and shape of surface unit cell, atomic structure can be retrieved with high accuracy. Of course, there is certain drawbacks, what are those? Demanding data analysis, strong multiple scattering, UHB, ultra high vacuum is essential no insulators accessible electron stimulated processes may take place. So, now we are going to discuss about the optical imaging probe characterization techniques. So, generally we are talking about the CLSM which is nothing but known as confocal laser scanning microscopy. What is the utility? Imaging or maybe ultrafine morphology generally we are getting. DLS dynamic light scattering that is for the particle sizing, SNOM scanning near field optical microscopy this is for the rastered images and 2 PFM 2 photon fluorescence microscopy generally it is for the fluorophores or maybe the biological systems. So, first we are going to discuss about the CLSM which is nothing but the confocal laser scanning microscopy. CLSM is classified under single beam scanning microscopy. It was pioneered by Marvin Minsky in the year of 1955. It is a valuable tool for obtaining high resolution images and 3D reconstructions. It is used with fluorescence optics. Laser beam is used to illuminate spots on the specimen itself. Images are taken point by point and reconstructed with computer rather than projected through an eyepiece. There are three steps of sample preparations. First one is called the fixation done to preserve the microstructure or cell sample by formaldehyde or maybe the glutaraldehyde. Staining direct method fluorescently labeled primary antibody or chemicals that are fluorescent indirect method binding of primary antibody plus fluorescently labeled secondary antibody and mounting by aqueous mounting medium. Then how actually we are performing this test? In confocal laser scanning microscopy exciting light from a focused laser beam illuminates only a single small part of a sample for an instant and then rapidly moves to different spots in the sample focal plane. Emitted fluorescent light passes through a pinhole that rejects out of focus light thereby producing a sharp image over there. 
because light in focus with the image is collected by the pinhole, the scanned area is an optical section through the specimen. Intensity of light from this in focus areas is recorded by a photo multiplier tube and the image is stored in a computer itself. So, here you can see the two images, both the scales are same, but first one is by the comparison of image of conventional light microscope and second one is the confocal scanning laser microscope. So, you can see that how the contrast of that image is totally changing and how we are getting the clear picture from the CLSM. So, we are going to show you there are several types of CLSM image in different fields like biochemistry, like astrocyte, nuclei and man nose receptor labeling. For nanotechnology, it is diatom pore structure and sizing. For cell biology, triple labeling of cultured cells, neuroscience multiple labeled dorsal root ganglion. So, what are the benefits of CLSM? Reduced blurring of image from light scattering increased effective resolutions, optical sectioning, x-jet sectioning, easy multicolor functioning, improved signal to noise ratio, magnification can be adjusted electronically, multidimensional analysis of living cells and tissues, clear examination of thick specimens. Of course, there are certain drawbacks also, it is the equipment cost is too high artifacts due to coherence of laser and laser fluctuations, high amount of photo bleaching. Next is called the dynamic light, st light scattering or maybe the DLS. DLS is also known as photon correlation spectroscopy or maybe the quasi elastic light scattering. It refers to measurement and interpretation of light scattering data on a microsecond time scale. It is used to determine particle or maybe the molecular size size distribution relaxation in complex fluids. So, generally we are having that light source then optical systems the detector scheme and then the digital correlator. How it works? Particles, emulsions and molecules in suspension undergo Brownian motion. If the particles are illuminated with laser the intensity of scattered light fluctuates in this particular case. Analysis of these intensity fluctuations yields the particle size radius R k using Stokes Einstein relationship, which is R k is equal to k t by 6 pi eta d, where k is the Boltzmann constant, t is the temperature, eta is the viscosity, and d is the diffusion coefficient. What are the advantages of DLS? Measurement are fast from seconds to minutes. Very small quantities of sample can be measured by this method. Any suitable suspending liquid, non-absorbing, relatively clear and not too viscous can be used. Technique is applicable from about 0.001 to several microns. There are certain disadvantages also. It does not produce a high resolution histogram of size distribution. Shape information is not easily obtained multiple scattering affects the data analysis, dust can make measurement and interpretation difficult. What are the applications? In measuring hydrodynamic size of nanoparticles, polymers or proteins or maybe the biomaterials to study the stability of nanoparticles as a function of time for detecting the aggregation of nanoparticles. Next scanning near field optical microscopy, in short generally we are calling it as a SNOM SNOM. SNOM offers higher resolution, breaks the far field resolution limit by exploiting the properties of evanescent waves. These fields carry high frequency spatial information of object and have intensities that drop up exponentially with distance from object. So, detector is placed close to sample in near field zone. As a result, remains a surface inspection techniques. So, we are having the samples on the substrate itself, then we are having the objective notch filter, then we are having the objective and then after that we are having the photo multiplier tube which actually detects the signals. SNOM principle, light passes through a sub wavelength diameter aperture and illuminates a sample that is placed within its near field at a distance much less than the wavelength of the light. 
Light is localized in a spot of nanometer dimension with a diameter smaller than the wavelength of light. In SNOM, image is a central spot only, no other diffraction rings, hence appear as a single spot and has high resolution. What are the advantages? High resolutions up to 25 nanometer, analysis of various properties made possible through contrast, no spatial sample preparations is required, can be used for different kind of samples like conductive, non-conductive or maybe the transparent. Disadvantages, very low working distance and extremely shallow depth of field, not conductive for studying soft materials especially under shear force mode, long scan times for large sample areas for high resolution imaging. SNOM applications in study of quantum dots for single molecule spectroscopy, in imaging of biological samples with fluorescent labels for study of nonlinear optical properties. Then the last one is called the 2 photon fluorescence microscopy or maybe the 2 PFM. It is a fluorescence imaging techniques that allow a, allows imaging of living tissues up to 1 millimeter in depth, differs from fluorescence microscopy where excitations wavelength is shorter than emission wavelengths as wavelengths of two exciting photons are longer than wavelength of emitted light. It uses near infrared excitations light which can also excite fluorescent dyes for each excitations two photons of infrared lights are absorbed and infrared light minimizes scattering in the tissue. Due to multi photon absorption, background signal is strongly suppressed. Both effects lead to an increased penetration depth for these microscopes. So, generally we are doing it by the two photon excitations. So, due to its deeper tissue penetrations for efficient light detections due to reduced photo bleaching effect. So, of course, it is better two photon excitations, it is an alternative to the confocal microscopy. So, basic phenomenon two photon excitations occurs through the absorption of two lower energy photons via short lived intermediate states. After either excitation process, the fluorophore relaxes to the lowest energy level of the first excited electronic states via vibrational processes. The subsequent fluorescence emission process for both relaxation modes are single and two photon microscopy. Here it is the Jablonski diagram of one photon, this is here the one photon excitation is taking place and two photon, here the two photon excitation is taking place, which occurs as fluoropores are excited from the ground state to the fast electronic state. So, you can see that e this one is our electronic ground state, so it is going to the fast electronic excited state. So, these all are the examples of two photon fluorescence microscopy. So, first is the 3D image from two photon microscopy of mouse brain veins. So, this one. Next B is the 3D model two photon image of kidney bud. This is the two photon excitations 3D vasculature and this is the 3D mosaic tiled image of a lymph node. So, what are the applications? Two photon microscopy have an impact in areas such as physiology, neurobiology, embryology and tissue engineering for which imaging of highly scattering tissue is required. Highly opaque tissues such as human skin have been visualized with cellular details. Clinically it may find an application in non-invasive optical biopsy for which high speed imaging is required. Advantages? High 3D imaging of biological sample in vivo higher fluorescence collection efficiency, deeper penetration in thick and scattering tissues, no bleaching beyond focal plane, lower autofluorescence background, potentially more sensitive. What are the limitations? Substance to be studied should have fluorophores, perturbations of structure and dynamics by fluorophore, slightly lower resolution. So, now we have come to the last part of this particular lecture. So, we are going to summarize the whole lecture. 
So, in this particular lecture, we have discussed about the nanomaterials. So, nanomaterials characterizations is necessary to establish understanding and control of nanomaterial synthesis and applications. For characterization of nanomaterials, a large number of aspects might be of interest like say size, shape, structure, chemistry, crystallography, etcetera. Due to wavelength, electron microscopy in its different variations is most employed method for characterization of nanomaterials. Spectroscopic methods and 3D related methods like tomography complete the results. Nanotechnology has a lot of potential as a futuristic approach, but would be largely governed by simultaneous progress in the newer, faster, simpler and more efficient characterization techniques for nanomaterials. See of course, after generating the nanomaterials, we can uh, as much as we can able to generate the data or maybe the about the informations about those materials. So, it will be beneficial or maybe it will be helpful for further studies. Thank you.